At this time, we will observe the Lord's Supper. And in this ordinance, we remember the death of our Lord by eating a symbol of his body and by drinking a symbol of his blood. We're making a proclamation of his death until he comes. And we do this because we are grateful for the redemption that we have in his blood and of the eternal life that we have in him. To prepare for this, we will look at a passage of scripture which reveals some of the benefits that we enjoy because of the death of Christ for us. And if you don't have a Bible, we, we ask that you uh, raise your hand and the men will see that you get one. If you don't own a Bible, this is your gift to keep. So when you get your Bible, open it to chapter 5 of 1 John, the epistle of 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look to, at some verses that are often used to try to give new uh, believers assurance of salvation. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 13 of this chapter. Uh, pray with me as we begin to look at this. Father, as we turn to your word, we pray that you will bless it to our hearts, that what you have said will ring in our hearts the message that you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When you have your Bible open to 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, you can follow along as I read. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The testimony is clear and straightforward. God has given the gift of eternal life to us, and this life is located in his Son. Eternal life is not earned by doing good. It's not based on human merit. It's given by God to those who do not deserve it, but who do receive his Son. If you have the Son of God, you have eternal life. If you do not have the Son of God, you do not have eternal life. Verses 11 and 12 tell us that God gave us eternal life through his Son uh, to those who lacked eternal life. And verse 13 tells us that he wants those who have believed in the name of his Son to know that they have eternal life. I remember as a young man that I was given these verses to try to assure me that I had become a Christian. And the teaching went something like this. Uh, I believe it, or God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, I believe that John had something more than verses 11 and 12 in mind when he wrote verse 13. Uh, that, and uh, he, he's, I think what he had in mind was the rest of his epistle. I think that he wrote the entire epistle in order that you may know that you have eternal life. When, uh, he says, uh, when he says, I believe, or I, I've written these things to you, I, I, uh, he says that, uh, th that you may know you have eternal life. And what I want us to do is circle through this book I'm just going to read, a, pick out a few passages. I want you to hear the type of test that he gives throughout this book that helps people to know that they have eternal life. And as, as you do this, there are tests of belief, what you believe about Jesus Christ. There are tests of holy living. There are tests of loving your brother. So we'll, we'll begin in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, if we say that we have, eternal, or have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In verse, chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, we read, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 
But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he says, The one who says that he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves the, his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause of stumbling in him. Chapter 2, verses 28 through 29, John says, Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, we have a passage that sets in stark contrast the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. He says, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin. Because he is born of God, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. For the one who does not love his brother, uh, nor the one who does not love his brother. This passage has been wrongly used by some holiness groups to teach that we can reach a stage of sinless perfection in this life. John uh, warned against such teaching in chapter 1, verse 8, when he said, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In addition, he tells believers in chapter 2, verse 1, that he is writing to them that they may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Believers still need Jesus as their defense attorney before their heavenly father. Uh, the, the passage in chapter three should be can understood as follows. The new birth has made a change in a person, such a change that his life has, uh, it changes the way he lives. He receives a new nature and the new nature has different characteristics than the practices and practices than the old nature. To go on practicing sin as he used to, goes against that new nature. A changed life helps the believer to know that he has eternal life. John cycles back around to love of the brethren again in chapter 3, verses 18 through 19, when he says, Little children, let us not love with the word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. Again in 4, 7, uh, seven and 8, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God imparts eternal life to helpless sinners on the basis of grace through faith, not on the basis of our works. But assurance that we have eternal life comes through continuing in the truth, through obeying the truth, and through loving one's brother. This morning as we partake of the Lord's Supper, Christian, meditate on what Christ has done for you. And if he's made you aware of sin, confess it. Draw near to your advocate. He is your safety and your access to the Father. If you're here and you're aware that you do not have eternal life, we ask that you not partake of the, uh, of the Lord's Supper the ordinance is for those who have come to trust Christ as their Savior and Lord. This ordinance is for them, and we urge you, though, to consider the fact that Jesus is the only way to God. Come to him. And he has said, he that comes to me, will I will in no wise cast out. So men, come now in service. <clears throat>